The title for the message today, we're in this Walking Tall series, Walking Tall in the Shadow of Wise Counsel. I've already read from the Isaiah passage, 55, our ways are not his ways, our thoughts are not his thoughts. We know as Christians that we have the Holy Spirit in us, we have the mind of Christ in us. I'm going to flesh that out just a little bit, but I want to get you thinking about decision-making for just a moment. Some of you probably have some life-changing decisions that you need to make right now. Some of those may involve a job opportunity, a dating relationship, to buy or sell something, maybe to get your car fixed now, or maybe you can't afford it, you've got to wait until later to make that decision. Whether or not to have surgery, the doctor's already given you some advice, and you've been thinking about that, trying to let it percolate in your mind and thoughts about whether or not you should do that. Some of you are still asking the question where to send your kids to preschool or school. Maybe you're teetering on the option of sending them to private Christian school. We know finances is often an object of concern, and we do have uh, some things that might be able to help you out there, but you're thinking, where do I want my children to get the very best education? Maybe some of you are thinking about taking that second job because the first job is just not making it. There's too much month at the end of the money, and you've got to figure out how to solve that problem. Maybe some of you are thinking, you know, I really don't want to go back and live with my parents, but in today's economy, that's really the best thing to do, even though you may be in your late 20s, 30s, or even older than that. Some of you may be thinking, oh my, do I really want my child to move back in with me, even though they're 30 or in their late 40s. But you're realizing that uh, there are some issues going on in our economy, and our culture is changing, and that may be good advice. On the other hand, it may be bad advice, but you've got to deal with that. Going to college, uh, seeking the right career path, all those things, they have to be decided upon. And you go to people for help, don't you? You've got confidence. You've got those people that are close to you, people you trust who give you good advice. Um, Usually, I'll be honest, Uh, Usually my wife dresses me. Uh, I hate shopping for clothes. It's just something that you will rarely ever find me doing unless I have to be there. So Debbie will go, and she knows about what I want, and she usually buys them. Well, yesterday was a special day, so my daughter bought me this outfit, and so I'm wearing this outfit in honor of her today. But as I was thinking now, and, and you people who are in your 60s and 70s, listen to this advice clearly. If your daughter is willing to dress you when you're 60, let her. She may do that for the next 30 years. Don't discourage that. All right? So we are advice-seeking individuals. Would you agree with me? Oftentimes we get bad advice. Oftentimes we get good advice. I remember I'm a 20-something kid. I'm coming back from a ministry event. I'm driving a 1973 Volkswagen. The fan belt goes out. I don't know a lot about cars. All I know is I'm starting to lose the battery, baby. The radio's getting down. It's going to be dark. Pull into a gas station. The attendant says, no problems. Yeah, you'll lose your lights eventually, but drive on. You've got no problems without this belt if it's broken. Well, I'm driving on down the road, and about 30 minutes into that, bump, 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 and I'm smelling this steam and this kind of motor stuff, and I didn't realize this. I guess my advice seeker guy didn't either. On that model, Volkswagen drives the cooling system. Yeah, I melted that motor. Now, some of you have a similar story. You thought you got good advice from someone, turned out it wasn't, and you had to pay the price. As Christians, the main focus point for the message today is that we have the mind of Christ in us. It's the Holy Spirit of God. We have the Holy Spirit that's in us, and wants to help us to understand those things that we're called to do. Now, let me give you just a very brief background 
on what this means. Holy Spirit, made up of two Greek words, hagion and pneumos, which means holy and spirit. So Jesus is with the disciples. The Spirit of God is from the very beginning creating and moving over the world. The Spirit of God always has been in unity, in triunity with the Father and the Son. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus is on earth for 33 years. Three of those years he's ministering and teaching and telling the disciples stuff. Now he's getting ready to go back up to heaven. He says, disciples, don't worry. I'm going to leave, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He's going to be in you and with you and will bring to memory all the things that I've taught you. So don't worry. In other words, guys, I'm not going to be here for advice. I'm going to leave and I'm going to send the advisor to you. Now, when we look at John where Jesus is talking about this. He says, I'm going to spend, send the Holy Spirit, and he used a couple of the words. He says, he is called the comforter or the helper. Now, these words come from a Greek word that we call periklesos or perikletos, and it means literally that, the helper or the comforter. Now, when Paul's talking in Romans chapter 12, 1, he says, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, and then he goes on to give them this urging. The same verb for urge is the periclesis verb. So it's advice, it's encouragement, it's good counsel. And so literally, we have the Holy Spirit in us to help us make good decisions. The Holy Spirit is also called the advocate. If any of you have gone to trial, you know what it's like to have a good advocate with you. Jesus Christ sits next to the Father. He serves as our advocate with the Father. The Holy Spirit is speaking to us, in us, and through us. And this is where our wise counsel comes from. Are you with me now? Wise counsel comes from the Holy Spirit. So we as Christians are called to walk tall, and we are walking behind Jesus, walking in the shadow of Jesus, or the shadow of the Holy Spirit. So that's where we get our message title today, Walking Tall in the Shadow of wise counsel or the Holy Spirit. If you have your Bible, I want to invite you to open up to Acts chapter 15. For those of you visiting with us today, we've been spending about eight months in Acts. We started talking about baby steps that changed the world. We got up to Acts 9, 10, and 11, saw the church rise up off of its hands and knees as babies and begin to take steps. We've been looking at the first missionary journey of Paul versus uh, chapters 13, 14. Now we're in 15. And now we're seeing the church walking tall, taking the gospel into all parts of the world, just as Jesus commanded. Now, Acts chapter 15, I'm going to do something a little different today. I want to narrate and give the main points out of the text. And then I'm going to tie in a practical illustration that I think most of us can relate to. And then we're going to blend that into the importance of wise counsel in education that comes through the school, through the preschool. So I'm sure you'll be able to stay with me. If you get a little lost, just raise your hand, let me know where you are, we'll try to back up, or you can catch me later. But I want to uh, do this and and, uh, make sure that it comes together and you understand. So Acts chapter 15, if you've got this, this is a pivotal chapter in the entire gospel of Acts, in the entire passage of Acts. It's, It's a great message because right now they have come to a huge disagreement or conflict in spreading the gospel. You know that Jesus said, go, wait, get the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit has come, go, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. Right now, they're in the uttermost parts of the world. That's where the Gentiles hang out. That's where the Greeks hang out. That's where the Romans hang out. We have a huge culture clash between the Jews and all of their moral ritual, 
ceremonial traditions and the Romans and the Greeks. We have a God-fearing culture of the Jews, and now they've become Christian, and they're learning how to walk this Christian walk, and they're conflicting with these Gentiles, these Romans, and these Greeks, and they're trying to figure that out. Now, how real is that in your life? How real is that in the Bay Area in California? We have huge cultural conflicts, moral conflicts, ceremonial conflicts, ritual conflicts. And as Christians, we are called to be in the world, but not of the world. So we need to understand the takeaway from God's word so we can live appropriately and share Christ to lost people. It's not our calling to beat them over the head, to knock the Bible down their throat, or for us to convince them what the Word of God says. Whose job is that? It's the Holy Spirit's job. The Holy Spirit was sent into the world to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. It's not our job to judge people to hell. It's not our job to judge people according to their sins. It's not our job to judge people according to the way they dress or the way they speak or their cultures. It is our job to produce the word of God through word and mouth, through lifestyle and action, and let the Holy Spirit work in their lives. And you know that. So we have this culture conflict. And so the first main point is that wise counsel keeps good things godly. Now, let's follow through this for a moment. 15, Acts 15, verse 1. Some men came down from Judah and began teaching the brethren. And this is what they were saying. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, most of you understand that. We have some kids who are with us today, so I'm going to try to be very careful as I move through this text. But there's some important things that we need to understand ritually that have to do with sexuality that's in this text. So the problem was these Jewish Christians who were good-hearted, wanted to serve the Lord, they were coming across these Gentiles and saying, you know, I can see that you've come to love the Lord. I can see that you want to serve the Lord, but I've also seen you're not circumcised. That was an outward sign for the Jew of their inward connection with the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yahweh, Elohim of the Old Testament, the God of gods. And that showed their outward connection with them. Now, they also had other ritual laws that had to do with eating. They washed a certain way. They prepared food a certain way. They could only eat certain foods. And these Gentiles, who are Romans and Greeks, they ate all kinds of things, even some things that might still be moving. And these Jews were going, you know, we've got a problem. We can't have table fellowship with these Gentiles who claim to be believers. Now, you see how that's a huge, huge problem. Because fellowship happens so often around the table. Unfortunately, in our culture, it happens more in the drive through at McDonald's. But really true fellowship in all of culture and time, all over the world, has happened around the dinner table. Think about that. What did these guys have to do when it got late and dark? Not a whole lot. I mean, these disciples couldn't hang with Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, let's go check out a movie. There's a new one that just came to town. Come and give us your advice on this movie. Or, hey, Jesus, let's go back to my place and we'll do some PlayStation. We'll play some games, hang out, maybe walk the town, check out some stuff, whatever. They didn't have all that to do. I mean, think about what we have and what they had. So they would come home, they would work a hard day, they would come home and they would have fellowship around the family meal table. And here's where this conflict was. 
How could these Jews who wanted to love and serve Jesus, but yet had the tradition of Judaism, sit and have fellowship and break bread with these Gentiles? You see, the good things were the table fellowship things. Needed to jump back just a little bit. That's right. The wise counsel kept the good thing, which was the table fellowship thing, and kept it a godly thing. So wise counsel respects those good things. Now, here's what was happening. When they came together, they basically recognized that they needed some advice. The Holy Spirit's at work. People are getting saved. They're trying to figure out how to do table fellowship, but they had a problem. So they went to seek out wise counsel. The story tells us that these men, along with Paul and Barnabas, who had just finished their first missionary journey, they went up to Jerusalem, and that's where the mother church was. Now in Jerusalem, that's the seat of Judaism. So it would have been slanted toward the Jews. So in other words, if the Gentiles are going, man, they're going up to Jerusalem, and they're going to talk about whether or not we need to get circumcised, and it's going to be a home game up in Jerusalem, man, they're going to come back with the knife. I mean, guys, you know, the reality. When you came under the faith as a Jew or a Hebrew, you got the knife. Didn't matter how old you were if you wanted to be under the Hebrew religion as a God fear. Fortunately, if you were born a Hebrew, it happened when you were only eight days old. So you didn't have that resident memory that held that in your mind and heart. Ugh. Anyway. They know it's going to be a rigged, fixed fight already. They know these guys are going up to Jerusalem. They're going to come back from Jerusalem, and they're going to say, here's the knife, let's go. But they go up there, and you can read the text, hopefully in your own time. Most of you know it. But the text talks about the apostles and the elders coming together in verse 6 and looking at the matter. It talks about Peter and then later on James coming together and talking about this issue. Peter basically says, guys, you guys here in Jerusalem, you Jews, I've got to tell you, the same thing that happened to us happened to them. They got the Spirit just as we did. So Peter is trying to convince these guys the Holy Spirit has fallen on these Gentiles and they're saved. So Peter is putting in the plug saying, why do we need to look at circumcision and all of the different ceremonial and ritual laws? And there were hundreds and hundreds of them they had to live by. So Peter's moving them towards a positive response. And then James chimes in and he begins to move them towards a positive response. And they start talking about this and he goes into the Old Testament. And we've got a stretch or a scripture from the Old Testament beginning in verse 16. Talking about rebuilding the tabernacle of the Lord. Rebuilding the ruins that they believe had been left because the Jews, catch this. The Jews were more concerned about their ritualism than they were about their relationship with God. That's where they blew it. That's what had happened. So James takes them straight back to the Old Testament, and then he says, here's the deal, guys. This is my judgment. This is what I believe. This is the wise counsel that I seek from the Holy Spirit. And this is that we ask them to abstain from things contaminated by idols verse 20, from fornication, from eating things that that are strangled, and from blood. Now let's move to the second point. Because wise counsel keeps the godly things good. It's important to keep the good things godly. In our life, we always have to do that. There are good things that have nothing to do with spirituality, but we need to make sure they're ordained and done godly. It really doesn't matter if you want to go to a decent movie. I mean, the Bible doesn't say don't go to a movie, but there are some groups of people in their church or denomination. I belong to a church like that for years. They said you can't go to movies. You can't go mixed bathing with a husband and a wife going to a swimming pool where there are other adults present. Women 
you can't wear jewelry, makeup. They, they had this well-defined. And so James is saying that the godly things, now the good things, the, you know, the jewelry or the, the makeup, someone said that you know, even an old barn looks good with a fresh paint, a, a paint cover paint on it. I mean, the, 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 the good things, the ordaining things, they're okay, but they can be taken to excess. So keep the good things godly, but keep the godly things good. So what James is saying here is God instituted food ritual practices for a reason. We don't understand all that, but it does make sense. In those days, it's not best to eat raw meat. And pork especially had problems with eating pork that wasn't cooked well. There were sexual diseases that could be spread. There were purity laws regarding that. So James hones in on the godly things because, remember, it has to do with unity. That's what it's all about. This message is about unity coming together around the family table. And if we come around the family table and I'm not going to eat what you're going to eat and you're not going to eat what I'm going to eat and we've got to eat different stuff, we're divided over our food, right? That's going to divide us over our preferences our preferences will divide us in culture, and our culture will divide us in communication. You see, that's where the problem is. That's why oftentimes when I go and eat at someone's home, I will do all I can to refrain from saying, I don't like that. Even if I don't, I don't want to say it because I don't want my host to feel they've cooked something I don't like. Now, you may be different. Some of you are going to say, I hate that. Man, that stinks. I'm not going to eat that. Take that away from me. You may just be bold out in front in their face. I choose to look at life a little bit differently, especially if they're not Christians, and I want to share the Lord with them. So unity is the issue. John looks, uh, James looks at the, the, the ritual food laws, and he says, here's the deal. He ties in three things that are clearly good and godly things in their way of thinking. And those three things are, if it's been offered to an idol, just stay away from it. I mean, if someone doesn't tell you it's offered to an idol and you don't know it, okay, it really won't kill you. But if someone says, man, I got this on sale up at the idol shop, and it was just idol to, offered to Athena, and man, she was naked and stripped down, and we just got, yeah, yeah, I got that meat and brought it home, and let's dig in. You're going, ah, ah you know. Let me share my faith with you, and uh, you might get into those things. So stay away from things offered to idols. Secondly, stay away from, from food that's strangled. In other words, if a guy says, man, I just got this cow, I brought it home, and I strangled it to death, fought it, ran it down to the ground, cut it up, and here's a slab of meat, eat it. You might be thinking, hmm, full of blood, might cause a disease. And at that point, you might just be able to share with the person something about blood, eating blood, and those types of things. The third thing, stay away from things that are of blood. Now, we don't probably have a context for this, but if you've ever been to a country, for example, in Kenya, the Maasai tribe, uh, they will take milk from a cow, and then they'll slit a place in the neck of the cow where blood will drain out. They'll catch that in the cup with the milk, and they'll drink the, the milk and the blood. Nasty, nasty, uh, but that's a practice. Uh, I went to Germany a couple of, of, well, a couple of years, gosh, maybe 20 years ago. And anyway, I wanted uh, bratwurst because I love bratwurst. My mom made bratwurst with cabbage and her German uh, potatoes. And so I saw what I thought was uh, bratwurst on the menu. Turned out that it was bratwurst. Bratwurst. That means blood sausage. They take veins and they put blood in it and they weave it into a big sausage and you're eating capillaries full of blood. After the second bite, I was about ready to throw up. I, I just, I realized what I was eating. So, um, people do eat blood. Now, in our day, it's different the way we look at it. In their day, there were some health issues related to that. So James says, let's take these godly truths and let's make sure we honor them and they stay good. But the fourth thing is interesting. He throws in fornication. I've prayed and thought about this real hard. I didn't read this in any commentary, probably because it's a stupid idea. 
But I thought to myself, what does fornication have to do with food laws and eating and having fellowship around the table? Have you heard of Roman or Greek orgies? Eating and... Yeah. In other words... Don't have an intimate physical relationship with your neighbor at the dinner table with all of your guests. Seriously, think about it. That's what an orgy was. They came together. They had open relationships. Sorry, kids. And they ate. And then more relationships and more food. Then they went to the vomitorium. Oh, they put a feather down their throat, regurgitated so they had room to go back and do it again. That was the culture of these Greeks and these Gentiles, these Romans. And so these believers, these Jewish Christian believers sought counsel from the Holy Spirit and said, let's keep these godly things good, but let's do all things appropriate and according to the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. So they wrote this letter. They put these four things together. They crafted the letter. The letter is in verses 24 down to verse 29. And so they sent this letter off. And so the congregation is all gathered together. Now, these guys, man, they're probably sweating bullets. They want to know what's the verdict, man. Are they coming with the knife? What's going to happen? What are we going to have to do? We love Jesus. We want to be a believer. But, oh, man, some of you are worried about being baptized in front of people. Getting in a bathrobe and getting into a bathtub in front of public groups. Circumcision. So in verses uh, 30 down to 33, 34, it says, So they were sent away. They went down to Antioch. They gathered the congregation together. And they delivered the letter. <laughs> it said, and when they read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. Isn't that great? <laughs> they rejoiced. Whoopee! No nice. Let's eat. <laughs> Let's just go straight to the dinner table and hang out in fellowship. And that's what they did. And then it says, Judas and Silas, being prophets themselves, they were encouraged and they strengthened the brethren. And every preacher loves this. They strengthen the brethren with a lengthy message. Isn't that beautiful? (laughs) Should I read that again or would that be too lengthy? Let's go to the third point because this fleshes out the third point for us. The third point is wise counsel keeps the godly going for God's good. I had to throw in a lot of G's there. I don't know why, just for the fun of it. But here's here's the message. When we take wise counsel from the Holy Spirit, Those of us who are good, not because of what we do, but because of what Jesus has done in and with us. It keeps us going for God. Some of you have given up in some ways. You took advice. It was bad advice. You didn't know what to do with it. Some mistakes happened. Now you're trying to dig yourself out of it. Let me share with you a very quick financial illustration that I think will connect with some of you. We've hit on hard times in California in our economy. We may be recuperating just a little bit. But let's think about balancing your checkbook. Some of you are going, what? Balancing your checkbook. Now, having a checkbook is a good thing, right? Won't call it a godly thing, but it could be. But it's a good thing. It's a worldly thing. If you can't balance your checkbook because you either don't understand mathematics or the principles or you've not learned how to use the internet to balance your checkbook and you keep getting overdrawn and writing bad checks, that becomes a bad thing. Now, I would give you some advice. Go to someone who knows accounting or go to your bank and say, would you help me balance my checkbook? Not bad advice. Would you agree with me? So that's a good thing. It's godly advice. Go to someone. If you happen to walk in, the person's lost. Share Jesus with them. Say, hey, man, I just am a dummy when it comes to math. I want to be a great testimony. I don't want to write bad checks. I believe in Jesus. And share your testimony. That'd be great. If the guy in the bank or the girl in the bank is a Christian, rejoice. That's even better. They may give you more godly advice based on that. So you get your checkbook balanced. That's the goal. That's 
Keeping the good godly. Now, how about keeping the godly good? Let's say that you go to someone and they're not a Christian. And they say, man, just don't overspend. Balance your checkbook and you'll be okay. You walk out and you have the same problem. And then you come across a Christian who understands God's principle of giving and tithing. And that person says, Bill, you got a heart problem. You've got greed in your heart. You see, a non-Christian banker probably wouldn't tell you that, but a Christian banker most likely would. And then if you can keep your checkbook balanced, pay your bills, have a good testimony, you will keep going in the world of finance and business and make a positive impact. That's my financial illustration. Now let's get to Christian education. First of all, I do want to thank again all of you that are here with us today. We're going to have a special prayer time for you. This church was founded on the principle that church outreach and ministry can be done effectively using Christian education as a vehicle to reach the community. Now, that came about during a time, especially in California, I don't want to bash California, when the educational system was challenged, public education didn't provide options, especially in the area of science, creationism versus evolutionary thoughts about the creation of the world. And so all of a sudden, we're having things taught that we as parents don't feel are appropriate. Now, remember, in England, when the kids had to work long hours, six days a week, the church got together and said, hey, on Sunday, let's teach these kids reading, writing, and arithmetic, and let's have a school on Sunday. And that's where Sunday school came from. But then we gave education over to the government. And in my opinion, the government doesn't do anything really, really good. It does some things okay, but there's a lot of waste. And so some people believe that Christian education, Christian preschool, is a good and godly option. In other words, if I was going to give you wise counsel... If financially you had your checkbook balanced and God had placed you where you could send your kids to a private Christian school, my counsel would be, would you rather have a Christian teaching your child science or an atheist? But think about it. Would you rather have a Christian who is a good history teaching teacher teach your child history or an atheist? And all day long, I will say a Christian because they will know your kids, they will love your kids, they will be able to see beyond the history blockage and get Jesus in history in their today. And so we unashamedly work toward that goal. And that's our mission, love God, serve others, and change the world. And we want to keep going and doing that, church, don't we? That is our goal. In these difficult financial times, it's more challenging. But we are going to keep going for God because that's what he's called us to do. Some of you may have financial problems right now, and I may have hit a nerve or struck a chord with some of you. And you're going, man, how'd he know I just bounced that check or couldn't pay that bill or can't get the mortgage together for this month? I didn't know, but the Holy Spirit did and does. Some of you are struggling with other issues, maybe sexual, maybe financial, as I've already said, maybe health, maybe relational, maybe in the family, and you need wise counsel. I want to pray and ask you to be open to receive the wise counsel of God, and then we're going to have the group come up and lead us during a song of reflection. And then I'll come back and lead us during a prayer time. Would you pray with me right now?